Hi everyone, sorry. This is Kubila checking in. Um, I have a guest that'll be joining me very quickly. Um, so stay tuned while we get ready to go on air. Good morning and happy Thursday to everyone. You're tuning into Community Conversations on KLEK 102.5 FM. I'm your host, Kubila Jones, and I have a guest joining me very soon from NYIT, the uh, medical school here in Jonesboro, Arkansas. And so um, just hold on until they join us. But until then, I have a few announcements that I need to make um, today. The Northeast Arkansas Mutual Aid Society. Uh, this says today at 8 p.m. General Assembly Radical Democracy for NEA. I want to first give the disclaimer: Kelly K. Um, and the Voice of Arkansas Minority Minority Advocacy Council does not support, endorse, um, or oppose any political party candidate, anything like that. We just simply provide the news and information for you. So. Um, good morning. My guest has arrived. Um, good morning to you, Mr. Casey Pierce. How are Hi, you? Dylan. I'm great. How are you doing this morning? I'm wonderful. I was just uh, reading an announcement real quick for everyone. Uh, tonight, there's a general assembly. So if you would like to attend that um, event is tonight at 8 p.m. Um, there's some information on their page. You can find the link to the virtual meeting, Northeast Arkansas Mutual Aid Society. So please go find that information on Facebook and um, you can attend if you like. So anyway, we're gonna move on to our discussion for today. I really thank Mr. Casey for joining us last minute. Um, we had another guest planned, but there was a mix up, but it's okay, life happens. And, and Camille, gonna... <laughs> my apologies, that's, uh, that, that's, my, that's my fault on a miscommunication on, on um, my end. So hopefully um, maybe our guests will, will be able to jump in here, but. Um, I really appreciate what KLEK does to put out good information to our community, and that falls in line with a lot of what we've tried to do at NYITCOM uh, throughout this pandemic is to provide people with the information they need to make good decisions uh, as, as we uh, try to all um, make it through this pandemic and just uh, adjustments to life and and. Um, it's just incredible to think that we've been at this for a year, but I'm, I'm really proud to be part of an institution at New York Institute of Technology College of Osteopathic Medicine where public awareness, public education is a huge priority to us. And it's been, uh, while the, the pandemic has been anything but, but fun, it's been, um, I, I've gotten some satisfaction on being a part of an organization that's I think done a lot of good over the last year to help our communities. That's amazing. And I know that from the beginning, uh, the chancellor and the other administrative staff, they worked very hard to put measures in place to keep everyone safe. And I know you have a college campus full of young people. It's like they don't want to socially distance. They want to gather and cluster and they want to socialize. And I know they are having to adjust to a new normal um, very few are able to go to class and the professors are having to adjust to partial in-person, partial virtual. And it's just been a whole It has thing. been. <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you, Kabila, it's a little bit different on our end. So let me explain to people the relationship between NYIT Comet and Arkansas State and kind of how all that works. And then oh. um, the, the play out here. 
NYIT, New York Institute of Technology, is, is based on Long Island, New York. And about uh, almost 10 years ago now, the leadership at Arkansas State University uh, wanted to establish a medical school. And they figured out that operationally and financially, the best way to go about doing that was to partner with an institution that already had um, that infrastructure in place. So some leadership at, at Arkansas State and also with the city of Jonesboro, like Mark Young at the Chamber of Commerce, began traveling the country meeting with several different colleges who had osteopathic medical schools on their campus and might be interested in establishing another site. So that's how the relationship with NYIT came about. Uh, Arkansas State's leadership found the perfect partner in New York Institute of Technology. So uh, over the course of the next few years, they worked to um, establish a private public partnership. So okay. you know, a lot of your um, listenership and viewership, I'm sure, um, have been in Wilson Hall, had classes in Wilson Hall. Um, I did as an undergraduate, you did as well. So in uh, over the course of 2014, 2015, this building underwent about a, a $15 million renovation um, to format it from a classroom setting, um, a, a the basically the humanities building for Arkansas State University and turn that into uh, a medical school. So it used to be that Wilson Hall was kind of the centerpiece of campus and we like okay. our location here in the middle of campus. But now um, if you don't have business with the medical school, you really don't, um, you, you're not in Wilson Hall as, as an Arkansas State student. The new humanities building that's um, just to the east of us is where kind of that new centralized hub of, of campus is. So I say all that to say, um, we as a medical school, we're on Arkansas State University's campus, we're partners with Arkansas State University, but we're our standalone institution, whereas there's about 11,000 students in the um, Arkansas State University, um, Jonesboro campus. I, I give that number, I know that that's a moving target, but kind of a general. Um, we are enrolled for 460 students and only half of those, so about 230 students. Um, but fluctuates between 230, 250 of those students are actually on our campus learning. So wow. uh, again, I'm going to digress with you a little bit. So uh, medical school, the first two years are what we call didactic. So they're okay. in a classroom. Students are, are um, attending lectures on um, the, the basic sciences, anatomy, physiology, uh, you know, basically the, the lectures on how the human body works and functions, and then they're also attending labs. So um, gross anatomy lab and um, osteopathic manipulative medicine lab, which is a, um, something I can, I can explain further, but is what distinguishes, one of the big distinguishers between a DO and an MD, an osteopathic versus an allopathic physician. So our first two years, we're in a classroom. So again, as we go back to the conversations of the adjustments specifically we've made in Jonesboro, uh, we would be speaking to those uh, first and second year students. Our, okay. third, our third year students are in clinical education. So again, one of the things that differentiates us from another medical school is, um, at, say UMS in, in Little Rock is attached to a large teaching hospital. So those students, their first two years, they do their didactic portion on one side of the street of, of Markham in Little Rock. And then in years three and four, a vast majority of them that just cross the street and go into uh, the hospital and do all their clinical rotations in that hospital. Okay. So we're attached to a teaching hospital, rather what we do is we go out and build partnerships with hospitals all around the state and region. So, um, we have relationships, obviously, with St. Bernard's and with NEA Baptist in Jonesboro that are just vital to us. We would not exist without those partnerships. Um, so basically, our third and fourth year students go and work one on one with one of the physicians at those hospitals, and they're trained in um, different areas, family medicine, pediatrics, psychiatry, general surgery, OBGYN, pediatrics, uh, emergency medicine. So they'll spend four to eight weeks, depending on the specialty, um, with a physician that specializes in that okay. area, learning hands-on from them. So I've given you a big explanation to kind of uh, get you back. And, and I'd also like to point out that those partnerships, while our relationships with uh, NEA Baptist and St. Bernard's are strong, we have a great relationship with Arkansas Methodist Medical Center in Paragold. Um, 
But we also, we'll, we have students at MENA Reg Regional in MENA, Arkansas. We have uh, students in Northwest Arkansas. We work with North, Northwest Health in the uh, Springdale, Bentonville, Fayetteville area. Okay. Uh, just some great relationships there. So we've got students spread out. Um, Baptist Memphis is also a big partner of ours. We have students in that Memphis hub. So um, a big part of our training is done in those community hospitals around the state and region. And that plays into our mission we can get into, but, but I'll get you back on point just a little bit. I'm, I'm talking a lot. Um, no problem. So um, when you ask specifically the adjustments for COVID, what that's looked like for us is we're really fortunate Again, the way that we're set up as a additional campus location to New York, um, prior to last February, we were doing a lot of our coursework, um, or well, pardon me, there were several of our lectures that were streamed from Long Island to Jonesboro okay. and vice versa. So we were already set up in a virtual platform, even if our students were, uh, collab were gathering in Jonesboro to listen to someone in New York stream a lecture. We were very fortunate we had that infrastructure in place so that when we needed to go all virtual, it wasn't as big of an adjustment probably for our medical students as it might have been for some other students. Okay. So um, in March, we did take all of our lectures virtual and we have kept them that way. Um, it's been an adjustment, absolutely, but uh, our faculty, staff, and students have done just a remarkable job um, making those adjustments. That's awesome. Now, what about the students that have labs and that where they have to be hands on? How are those? What does that look like now? <laughs> That's a great question. So, um, you know, typically we do our labs and, you know, we're accredited for about 120 students per class. So we will have um, like we would typically do maybe three groups of 40 in a lab. Um, that's become 12 groups of 10. Or, um, you know, that might not be the exact number, but they've been much smaller groups. Um, okay. We have thermal scanners at the front desk. So when our students come in, they, uh, they scan their temperature to make sure that they're not running a fever. The facial recognition also shows whether or not they're wearing a face mask, a covering. <laughs> so um, if they're not, there's a computer voice that says, please wear a mask. Um, we, we strictly enforce uh, mask wearing in our building. So um, the students come in, they're in much smaller groups and um, they have their labs on campus. Um, one other thing is that it, it typically, our students will kind of congregate and make, you know, it's a, being in medical school is more than a full-time job. It, it's well beyond that. I mean, it's an all the time thing. Um, so our students often, they'll get here at eight o'clock for their labs and lectures. And um, they'll, between those times that they're slated to be somewhere, they'll, they'll gather to study together in a typical year. Um, they'll ha have their meals here. Unfortunately, that was just not something that we were, uh, were able to do safely. So um, pretty early on, um, our administration, we put a policy in place so that our students were only in the building for their labs and then they were not allowed to congregate together um, they had to go back basically to their to their homes once they were in so um all of our uh, our faculty are in full ppe while they're instructing while they're in those close quarters um and really the the most important thing is that it's worked these policies have worked we've been able to keep uh, our infections very very low on our campus um and identify early and isolate so we've been able to, uh, to operate uh, very efficiently, uh, even if it's been a little bit unorthodox. Okay. And do you feel that uh, no one like, okay, let me just say this. Of course, there's a, a new adjustment for everybody around the world. Um, for medical students, do you feel that this is, has been a blessing and a curse in a sense for them because they're going to be working in areas, depending on their specialty, they're going to have to wear safety gear. They're going to have to, you know, don the whole attire. So do you feel that this is good? I know this sounds crazy. I'm sorry. I don't but know it's good it's preparation for them. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's been challenging. But one thing that, that I would say is, you know, um, I don't know that there are many professions in the world that require more flexibility, more adjust on the go, more... 
um, than being a physician because you never know what you're going to see. You never know what you're, you're going to deal with. Um, there are obviously um, demands of that job that are pretty unique to other things. So I think that um, that, that part's kind of played into their education. Um, I certainly think that the opportunity to study a very unique um, disease uh, uh, that has impacted public health and public action in ways like nothing we've ever seen in our lifetime. I think that's certainly brought some unique opportunities. Um, you know, one of the things that, that is unique to me is part of my job as the marketing and communications director for our campus. I really enjoy getting to know our students, to tell their stories, where they're from, why they want to be physicians, how that's played out. And unfortunately for me, I've not had a lot of those experiences over the last year. And again, um, that's just one of the ways that the, um, the impacts of this thing. So um, unfortunately, I haven't, I myself, I know other faculty members would be able to tell some of those stories, but um, unfortunately, um, you know, I haven't gotten those interactions to kind of have those, but I do hope to, once we get back to some sense of, of normal, um, have those and, and hear from our students how it's kind of impacted them. Okay. Um, now, I will say a lot real quickly, you know, because our third and fourth year students are in those community hospitals, I think it's benefited them because they're part of the um, care teams there. They get okay. responsibility. They're not just standing around watching. So I do think it has provided some pretty unique experiences for our students that are in those places that have really been able to help um, contribute to the care and it, where where they're at learning. Okay. I want to say good morning to a few people. We're going to move on. Um, good morning to Derek Coleman and Ms. Linda Johnson Frazier. Thank you all for checking in. And for everyone that's checking in, if you have any questions for Mr. Casey, um, if you know someone that's interested in, in attending medical school here in Jonesboro, um, Mr. Casey will, will be the person to help answer some of those questions and or direct you to the right person, to uh, other persons to answer those questions. Okay, so I want to go back a little bit to um, the students that are able to work in these different areas, like you said, the community hospitals and clinics. I grew up in the Delta region, and we already know what some of the disparities those um, individuals face in those areas. Um, lack of medical, well, lack of high quality sometimes medical care. Um, sometimes you find there are older physicians that are still trying to work, and they not they may not be as up to date on some of the newer technologies and practices and things of that nature. So. A lot of these communities are just getting by with what they have. And I'm not trying to, you know, look down upon them, but that's just how it is. And so also now that we are in this new normal, this situation where we're having to really deal with this pandemic, um, do you feel that some students are now or maybe considering working in those areas? We know the pay may not be the greatest and it's not a glamorous life. However, it's about, like you said, public health. It's about getting people the care they need. So what are your thoughts on that? And what has been some of the discussion? Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head, Kabila. That goes back to our mission as a whole. You know, the reason why we were established here is because, um, just like you said, Arkansas ranks uh, near the bottom of states in physicians per capita. That's a fact. Um, annually, about in the bottom five, we don't have enough physicians to uh, address some of the health needs in our uh, in our state and region. Those numbers are really exasperated by rural communities, um, like places like a Phillips County or um, you know a um, a Mississippi Lee County. County. Yeah, Lee, Lee exactly. St. Francis, Phillips Cross, yes. anything out that way. <laughs> yeah, the Delta communities really, uh, and so we say that our target is um, the is Arkansas as a whole but the greater Mississippi Delta region, which is kind of like following the Mississippi River down mm -hmm. those rural areas of Illinois, of uh, Missouri, also into Arkansas, Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana. Um, that's all part of our mission to the, okay. the greater Mississippi Delta. Now, obviously um, being in Arkansas and being located here, that's a huge part of, of who we are and, and the area that we're, the central focus that we're trying to impact. So, we, yes, absolutely. When we interview students, we ask them about um, where they want to be and why they want to practice medicine. 
it really is a calling uh, to be a physician. It is way too hard. Um, it creates way too many sacrifices. The, the just um, getting through medical school, obviously there's a lot of reward to it, but um, you, you can't really be a physician unless you're called to uh, um, because of the, the effort and the, the skill and all those things that it takes to get there. So um, part of that is we really want we say here that the floor is training great physicians, okay. training physicians that practice great medicine. We also try to instill servant leadership into our students, um, which instills in them the idea that physicians are community leaders um, and that they have a responsibility. And a lot of that goes back to the public health idea. Um, okay. you know, you, you're aware, Quibilla, of a lot of the things that we're doing in the community. We have the Delta Caravan that goes yeah. to these rural communities and provides health screenings and health education. We partner with the food banks in those areas because nutrition is a big part of health. Um, yeah. So we are absolutely pushing and encouraging our students to go practice in these areas. And when I, when I spoke about how our third and fourth year set up in those communities, Physicians are more likely to practice in places that they've been exposed to during their medical education. There's, there's an abs absolute statistic that, you know, so if, um, you know, we get purposely get our students in these rural areas in their third and fourth year so they can see and experience and feel the needs in those communities, because without knowing those needs, they might not ever consider going and practicing there. So it is very pointed. All right, so we're just going to take a quick break on air, but we will continue the conversation on our Facebook live feed because I have I have lots of questions. But if you're listening on air, you can jump on Facebook real quick. We'll continue this conversation and we'll be right back after these announcements. Okay, my brain is all over the place because, you know, again, I grew up in that rural area. I knew no. I know what it's like. We had when I was under 10 yeah. we had a hospital and it was poorly funded um poorly staffed and it just it didn't last so it eventually closed down and so the next closest hospital was either for i grew up in mariana mm -hmm. so the next closest hospital was either four city or west helena which was a good 20 30 minutes you know depending on you know traffic and whatever and so imagine having an emergency, a serious emergency, and you're having to be rushed 20 miles plus, you know, one direction or the other. And, you know, so it was a challenge. Um, it's still a challenge. Yes. Now. You, you're so, absolutely right. So is it possible? I know local clinics can only do so much. You know, they do triage, they do lab work, you know, some of the basics. Is it possible, and has this been discussed about setting up make I don't want to ugh, makeshift hospitals that can do a little more to help prolong the life of someone in the case of an emergency until they get to the bigger facility? Yeah, you're speaking a little bit out of my expertise area there, <laughs> okay. but you know there are your but what you're speaking to is an overall. Um, conversation about healthcare and access and education that NYITCOM is trying to be part of a solution to. We're involved in all kinds of um, conversations um, specifically geared to public health and improving um, access to healthcare. I don't know specifically how to answer the question that, that you're asking, but we're absolutely involved in those conversations and it is, um, those are issues that need to be addressed. You know, you're speaking specifically to an emergency situation, but um, in non-emergency situations, telemedicine is a huge thing right now, um, okay. especially, you know, the, the pandemic has really brought a lot of telemedicine to the forefront um, because of the way that it protects both the physician mm -hmm. and the, the patient from being in a setting where they might be exposed. And NYIT Common Day State was the first medical school in the country to provide telemedicine education as part of its core curriculum in the first year. Um, so we have that infrastructure in place. We have that technology. Our students are being trained. And one of the reasons why that's so important is because um, the research shows that doctors like telemedicine. They like the concept of it, but adaption is slow because they they 
might not necessarily have the training. And when they're trying, you know, physicians get really busy really fast. And when they're yeah. trying to see patients and help a large number of people, the opportunity to stop and learn this, you know, may just may just not be there. So one of the ways that we've addressed that issue is by training physicians with that technology while they're in medical school, helping them get comfortable with it so they can then implement that in their practice when they become a physician. That's wonderful. And I'm one of those people that benefits greatly from telehealth um, because of physical abilities or inabilities. And so we're getting ready to go back on air in a few moments, but um, I definitely want to continue that in just a little bit and talk about how the students are working with it. Absolutely. Welcome back to Community Conversations on Kelly K 102.5 FM. I'm your host, Kobila Jones, with my very special guest, Mr. Casey Pierce from the NYIT uh, School of Osteopathic Medicine. I got it right. <laughs> um, and it's a long it's, name. It, 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 you nailed it. Good job. Thank you. So we've been talking about, you know, how the students have been adjusting some things that are happening on campus and off campus and um, everything in between. And uh, we talked a little bit off air about a facility, a hospital that used to um, be in existence when I was growing up. And Ms. Linda Frazier says um, it was called Lee Memorial Hospital. Um, and so, yes, unfortunately, in some of those smaller communities, um, those hospitals are no longer in existence. I want to say good morning to my sister, Gwen Henderson, who was checking in. Thank you very much. Um, so I know we were, we were going to talk about the vaccine today, but we'll save that conversation for another day. But I just want to talk about, again, how the students are adjusting and um, going back to the public health piece. I know I'm sorry, I'm going all over the place. Um, going back to the public health piece. Um, we also have to educate individual the residents, you know, while you are educating the doctors on how to use the new technology. That's what we're, we're talking about telehealth. Um, you also, you have to educate the community about the different things that are happening, the um, diseases, infection, um, just general health information. So again, how are students, um, well, are students now trying to expand their thought process is all, how can I create information packets or campaigns or setups yeah. or something? <laughs> Our students are, um, are taught about public health. We're very involved in policy. We have a fellowship program with Rick Crawford's office with Congressman. He's been very gracious um, in that relationship with us where a couple of our students per semester get to go um, work in his office to create health policy to specifically okay. help people in this region. Um, you know, we spoke about the Delta Caravan to go in these places, not only screening people to help give them a picture of what, of where their health might be, but to say, hey, this is something that's going on with you. This is what that means. Um, and this is where you can go to address that, to go help that. So um, absolutely, we're, we train our students and ingrain in them, um, we're, and that goes back a little bit to the osteopathic philosophy of osteopathic medicine, uh, I, I think, spends a lot of time on preventative care. Um, there's a huge emphasis on that. So it's not just treating the current state of the patient that um, an osteopathic physician is seeing, but also how did we get here, what might be coming up, and what can we do to prevent those things. So our students are absolutely trained with all of those um, thought processes in mind. And Camilla, you know, you spoke specifically to the vaccine, and I do want to address that. While while I'm not a scientist, I'm not medically trained. I'm very upfront with that. I work with a lot of very talented, um, very trustworthy physicians, and I've had people in my family that have asked me, you know, will you get the vaccine when it's available to you? And my answer is a resounding yes. And here's why: Dr. Spites, Dr. Laurent, uh, um, Dr. Cope, Dr. Abraham. Um, all of these physicians that I know, and, and I could list every faculty member um, here, these are physicians that have studied the science, that are familiar with how this works, that understand the consequences um, and understand what we're dealing with. They have all enthusiastically received the vaccine as soon as they could. Um, okay. So while I may not understand it fully myself, what I do know is that I trust these physicians that do. 
and they've been yeah. quick to uh, to take it. And I think that's really important for people to understand. Okay, thank you for that. And I want to give definitely a shout out to Dr. Danvis and the, again, the other staff members who coordinated the vaccine um, set up. I don't know if it was in the, at the, um, I keep wanting to call it the Convocation Center. The, the First National Bank first, Arena. First National Bank That's Arena. Right. It will always be um, the Convocation Center, but it is also the First National Bank Arena. Yes. Yes. And so um, many of the staff members have received their vaccine. And so how about that is one step forward to keeping them safe and keeping their students safe as well. Um, now, you talked about the students working with uh, Congressman Rick Crawford. For those who don't know, he is the representative for, uh, I don't know the district number, please forgive me, but for the, the Delta. Huh? I believe it's the first district. The first district, which is that region that we were discussing earlier. And so I'm, I'm sure that he faces some challenges when trying to put best practices in place um, and legislation and things like that for those individuals and tie health matters into that. And I want people to understand health goes beyond medicine. Health is, you know, your mind, body, and soul, like your it's a 360, the total man, total woman. Um, health encompasses all of that. So if one area of your life or your body or whatever is lacking, it's going to affect you in other areas as well. Um, so we have to take care of the mental health you know, the physical health, the spiritual health, all of that, you know. And anyway, that's a discussion that we often have with the social work department when they're doing their annual um, health disparities conference. They want to tackle the whole person <laughs> versus just one area. Absolutely. Speaking of that, do your students work closely with, now that social work is in the College of Nursing and Health Professions, do you all have a working relationship with those students? <laughs> we absolutely do. Um, Dr. Adrienne Loftus is uh, on our, our faculty. She heads what, what we call our interprofessional education um, platform. So okay. it's a little bit different again, like everything in the time of COVID. But um, when, when we're not in ha having to restrict our gatherings and things like that, we do these yeah, inter IPEC, Interprofessional Education Conference, where the um, College of Nursing um, and us collaborate. So we'll get medical students together with nursing students, PT students, social workers, and they'll be given a situation where, hey, this is the case. Um, you guys as a team come together and figure out how to best address it. And that gives an opportunity for those students to understand not only their roles, but how their roles play into the healthcare team. And, um, and learn to work together and coordinate together. Yes, because that's all, you're absolutely right. That all plays into how patients are, are, are cared for. And um, it, it is a big part of their education. And we, it's another place where the relationship between NYIT and Arkansas State University is so beneficial to both parties. Then how can we, the community, um, um, really support these students? I know there are times that I've gone to a clinic here, um, and I won't say the name because there's so many clinics. And anyway, I go to a local clinic here um, to receive medical care when I was getting out of the house. And so oftentimes I will see a student, not, I don't know what year they were in, but um, a student. <laughs> and so I didn't have a problem with them because I know they're learning. And the only way for them to gain experience was to learn, you know, was to interact with the patients. Now, for more serious matters, a doctor or a nurse practitioner would come in. Um, however, for some of the basic care, it would be a student. So how can we, the community, really support these students as they're out in the field and really trying to learn how to do their job? Well, uh, the one thing I'd say is that those students are always going to be partnered very closely with a physician. So um, I, I don't want people to feel like they would go and see exclusively a student that's not under the um, direct uh, supervision of a physician. Um, so, um, you know, I think just a, um, one, of, one of my big jobs is trying to tell people about our mission and what we're trying to do. 
And uh, I just think helping the community understand what we're all about, what our mission is, what we're trying to do. Um, uh, there's that that's a big part of, of, of my job. Um, and, and I hope that your experience there w was a very pleasant one. I think the mm -hmm. feedback that we do get from people. Um, and I, I would also say the physicians, you know, I saw a clinician um, for an ear infection a few, a few weeks ago, and he spoke to, um, he takes our students, he works with our students in that relationship that I've described. And he was very complimentary about where they were in, in their understanding um, and education. So I think, um, and, and that was very heartwarming to me for him to say that, that, that we're doing a good job and, and kind of practically. So, you know, I think it's just a, an understanding kind of what to you said about where our students are. Absolutely. All right, thank you. So I want to share some things. Um, Casey and I are working on a plan to push out more health-related topics. Um, that's something that I've been wanting to do here at KLEK. Um, I'm a big advocate for awareness matters. If anyone follows me, I haven't been pushing it as much, but I hope to ramp that up very, you know, here soon. But awareness matters is one of my I say taglines because of the condition that I have. And it's one of those that is not, I'm not gonna say it's not well known, it's not um, talked about, discussed, or treated at a rate that it needs to be treated. And this is a, is a discussion I've had in the past with other professionals. And they have admitted in medical school, um, lymphedema is not one of those things that gets a lot of attention, even though many American or well, people worldwide suffer live with this <laughs> and so not just my condition but all conditions i'm an advocate for everyone and everything possible so casey and i are trying to work on a plan to push out more of these health topics and create these awareness campaigns um just to get people talking and like oh i never heard of that i never thought about that or let's have these meaningful conversations within your family unit and social circles to raise awareness for these things some people suffer in silence because they feel no one cares, no one understands. Who's gonna listen to me? You know, and so I would love to see more conversations happen. Um, and I just wanna thank you for helping me put together a plan to push this out. I would also love to work with students. Everything's pretty virtual right now and I understand that, but if there are students in certain specialties, who would like to get on board with certain campaigns each month, that would be amazing as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And Camille, you know, we've focused so much of our uh, public outreach and public information on COVID because obviously that's the most encompassing and most pressing thing. But one of the things as the uh, communications director for medical school that that this has shown me is absolutely the opportunities there are to um, get our physicians out um, to utilize some of the media platforms, the, the information platforms, um, you know, we've, Dr. Spites has started a, a Facebook page where he regularly posts COVID information. Um, if you're not following him, I, I encourage you to. Uh, it's a public page, so you just go to uh, Dr. Shane Spites, S-P-E-I-G-H-T-S, and follow him, and, and he's regularly updating uh, people about the latest, um, you know, answering some of the latest questions about whether it be the vaccine or um or the latest treatments or the latest trends, you know, something he posted the other day was about this UK variant that we're starting to hear about this new strain. So I say all that to say, we've really focused on providing COVID education. And I think it's been, I've been really proud of the work that we as an institution have done in that realm. But I think once we do get past this, we have learned some of the platforms that we have and audiences that we've built and credibility that we've built, that we will be able to speak to, um, I'll, use that platform in a number of ways to continue that health education just on other topics like like you've mentioned. Yes, um, I would love to see some partnerships form here. Um, and again, I know that, um, you know, there's students in different specialties. And so if we could definitely make that connection happen, Absolutely. that would be wonderful. Um, and, you know, another thing concerning COVID, you know, some people are, dispelling or they're they're kind of dismissing that all of these deaths are COVID well as we know that some people yes had underlying conditions however COVID 
the um, effects of COVID amplified those um, pre-existing conditions. Yeah. And so I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to speak out of turn. However, we need to still address those conditions and health issues as well on You're top right. of COVID. So You're it's absolutely a- right. And, you know, that's one of the things that, that we've said. There's not anything there. Um, one of the best ways that, that you can, one of the best things you can do for yourself, as always, is to eat lots of fruits and vegetables, um, lower your, um, your, your fat intake and your bad macros, as we would say. Um, and, and, and again, I'm not a nutritionist or physician, so I want to be careful how I use my words, but uh, improve your diet and exercise and get yourself in a physical condition that, that puts you in optimal position to fight COVID if you do happen to contract it. So uh, yeah, absolutely. What you're saying is um, there is definitely a um, general health education element that plays into all of this. Yes. And it takes all of us in our communities to work together to kind of, you know, let, I know I live in this peace, love and joy kind of bubble. And, you know, I like it here, (laughs) but I am a realist at the same time. But I feel that we all have to work together the be- as best we can. Um, that's the only way that we're going to get better and grow and continue to advance in many areas. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to leave it there. I'm a sociologist at heart. And so I'm always looking at how can we as a society, starting with individual communities, grow and advance and work together. Like we have to. We do not live on an island, so we have to learn how to work together. So that's my two cents for it. Absolutely, today. and that all plays into um, our mission and vision here at NYT: um, impacting public health, providing health education. Yes, and that's why I'm happy we have this platform here at Kayla K to provide information. Now, as we know, things change on a rapid <laughs> basis, and so as soon as you all get information. You all have been really great at keeping us up to date, you know, and um, helping push that information out. So thank you all for that um, as well. And thank you for the partnerships that we are developing. I hope that every month we have several doctors and possibly students come on to talk about the different health issues um, and what the community needs to know in general, and then how to get more information on said topic. Absolutely. All right, so um, we have, um, hopefully we can get Dr. Abraham on um, before the month is out to talk about the vaccine. I know that we are under a new administration and this is not gonna be a political discussion. However, how are students, um, or do students take time to look at some of the policies that are coming from the top down? (laughs) Absolutely. You know, health policy is a huge part of who we are. Um, Dr. Brooke Laurent um, is the ex- executive director of the Delta Population Health Institute. And as you mentioned, Kabila, you know, health care is just such a small part of, of big H health, um, you know, access to um, healthy foods, um, access to education, um, all those things play into, uh, into that. So we put, we've put together this organization that Dr. Laurent is leading, that several of our faculty members and our students are involved in, in learning about how all of those things come together, uh, bigger picture to impact the overall health of our communities. So those are issues that our students are being trained on, that they're looking at, that they're involved in, and that a lot of them are very, very passionate about, just like many of our faculty members are. Okay. And one thing we haven't talked about, and I know this may be a question for someone else, but we know that we have these different um, demographics of people in our communities. You have the babies, you know, up to preschool, elementary, whatever. You have your teens, you have your adults, and then you have your elderly population. And I feel sometimes the elderly, the aging, I should say, the aging population, they get overlooked or undertreated or, you know, each population has its own disparity that it faces. However, um, the aging population seems to face some different challenges. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, 
you're, you're absolutely right. And again, that is a little bit beyond my my expertise to speak specifically to what those issues might be or or how those are being addressed. But um, but you're right. We talk a lot about um, serving the underserved and um, meeting those areas that uh, that um, have been underserved. So that's a big that plays into our mission certainly. Okay. All right. So we're going to take another quick break here soon. And so uh, tell people how they can find information on NYIT. So our website is nyit.edu slash Arkansas. Um, the best place to get regular updates about what's going on on our campus, uh, what our students are doing, and the um, educational pieces that our faculty are putting out is to follow us on Facebook at N-Y-I-T-C-O-M-A-R. So N-Y-I-T-C-O-M-A-R, as in Arkansas. Um, that's our Twitter, our Facebook, and our Instagram um, pages. Okay. Those are our handles. So that, that's the best way to, to get um, up-to-date information on, on what exactly is going on here. All right. So with that, we're going to take a quick break for those of you listening on air. You can join us on Facebook. We'll continue this conversation, um, but I'll be looking over the website and pulling out some more information, but we'll be right back after these announcements. All right. I'm thankful that you were able to jump in and uh, keep the show going this morning. Thank you, Casey. Well, my, my sincere apologies, Camilla. It was uh, a miss. I miscommunicated the time. It was, that's all um, my fault. So um, hopefully uh, we will be able to, to reschedule, but I, I've, I felt terrible about that. Um, this, Dr. Abraham is um, a brilliant man, and um, I know that your listeners will benefit greatly from getting to, to hear him. So um, hopefully we'll be able to reschedule him fairly quickly and, um, and let him speak to some of the specifics about the vaccine. I'm looking forward to that because, um, you know, I'm, I try not to get too engrossed in the news, but because of the industry that I'm in, I have to stay on top of, you know, some information. So um, this is a current looking... events program. Absolutely. <laughs> so I was looking at, you know, right now there are some states that mishandle the storage of the vaccine. And so a lot of it has gone to waste. And so, you know, okay, what can we do? How can we get the vaccine to people quicker? And I know, that, again, that's way outside of my <laughs> expertise, right. but, you know, we as a community, again, we have to work together. Like when one area suffers, we all suffer. It affects us all, whether we believe it or not. Um, and again, I'm not trying to speak down or throw shade, as young people say, at anyone, but those of us who are in a higher tier of knowledge or having or whatever you want to call it, those of us who are in a, on a higher level we have to be willing to reach it down and reach back and reach well, out. Uh, and I'll tell you, Camille, the re, Dr. Spites, uh, and I'll, I'll, you know, his, um, he long avoided getting on Facebook, just the, the interpersonal interaction. Um, but he was at a conference last year that spoke to basically the responsibility um, he has as a physician to get involved in these conversations because there's so much misinformation out there that if no one's putting out good information to um, combat that, then, um, you know, then that allows misinformation to kind of uh, just avalanche. So uh, he, along with our other faculty members who you've seen in the media, who you've seen doing interviews, who uh, like on community conversations, um, we feel it's very important, just like you're saying, to speak at a general level to help people understand what's going on, why they need to be concerned and what precautions and actions they need to take to help us all get through this thing. Yes, and that Ms. Linda makes a comment to what you just said. Um, I would like to say that if you're asked to put a mask on when visiting other businesses, please stop getting angry and disrespectful. Hashtag we're all in this together. Like, you know, right. I know some people don't like to feel constricted. I love wearing lipstick and lip gloss, but hey, if it means keeping the next person next to me around me safe, then I'm gonna sacrifice my lipstick for the day, you know? And, and, you, know you know, there <laughs> are actual studies that, that we've shared. Um, you know, one that, that I like to point to, the state of Kansas um, allowed counties on an individual level to decide whether they would put mask mandates in place. 
Wow. And it was apples to apples, cut and dry, the difference in the counties that the man, there was a mandate versus the ones that there weren't, the number of cases they had. Oh, wow. Welcome back to Community Conversations. I'm sorry I had to jump in. You caught the tail end of a conversation we were having, and we're going to pick up on that just a little bit. Uh, even though today it's not all about COVID, uh, we are still in this space, and we have to navigate accordingly. And so I want to just say thank you again to Casey for joining me today. Thank you for everyone who checked in on our live feed. I want to say good morning to Mr. Henry Burrell. He says, good morning, Casey. Um, Henry's a good friend. Hi, Henry. Thanks for listening. Yes, he's been really doing his part to try to connect these pieces and dots in our city of Jonesboro. And I don't even think he's not a native of Jonesboro. So we've seen a lot of people who are implants, who are working hard or just as hard as the ones who live here to help connect us all together, no matter what demographic you re- you live in, That's age, right. race, gender, whatever. There are people who are working together who are trying to bring us all together so that we can live as cohesively and in harmony as possible. I know that's a oh, wishful thing, but anyway, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> uh, we were talking about masks and, you know, again, we are under a new administration, not trying to get political here. But there are some mandates that are going to be coming down from the federal level. And I know people are going to push back at it, but COVID-19 is such a serious disease. And it's, it's, it mutated quickly, faster than some of the professionals can really study it and get an understanding on it. So, again, we just have to work together as best we can. Yeah, Camilla, as we were coming out of the break, I was sharing with you that... Um, you know, there are studies that have shown the effectiveness of masks. I was, I was speaking directly, if you don't mind me repeating myself, there's a study from that the University of Kansas performed when, um, you know, a lot of states put together, put in place statewide mask mandates um, last spring, last summer. Kansas actually let the counties themselves decide whether they were going to. And uh, I can't remember the exact number, but there was a significant number that did and a significant number that didn't. But in the counties that put mask mandates in place, their number of COVID cases, the growth of the virus in those areas was significantly lower than the places where they were not. There was another study by uh, Vanderbilt University in Nashville that showed that counties and and states that had mask mandates in place, um, hospitalization rates were significantly lower in those areas than in places that there were not. So uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be upfront that I'm not a physician, but I work with a lot of very talented um, physicians that and that are also very trustworthy. So when they tell us, and, and Camille, I could go on this spill for a long time too. You know, when we go to our physician and they say you have high blood pressure, here's a prescription, go to the pharmacy. We don't question that. When they when we go to an orthopedist that that um, tells us that we need our ACL repaired. We don't seem to question that. We do what they say because of their training and their practice. So it's been um, confusing for me to see why we trust our physicians in so many different areas, but all of a sudden as this virus has come along, um, there's been a distrust, there's been a disconnect there. And that's something that, um, that, that's been a little bit hard to understand. And again, I would just go back to, I trust my physician. Um, so, um, and I, I think people should trust our medical leaders and listen to the advice that they that they have been giving us and continue to give us. Uh, um, even the repetitiveness that we're, we're tired of hearing, wear your mask, wash your hands, uh, avoid gatherings, keep your distance, all of those things. Um, as tired as we are of hearing them and how um, numb those messages may have got, they're still so important. Yes. And we're also in the midst of flu season. I've seen people report they've had pneumonia and things of that nature. So there's so many different elements and so many factors to all of these diseases and viruses. And, you know, so we could just take one step to prevent one thing, hopefully, you know, this, that's my message today is let's all do our part. Um, If you had the flu or a cold, you wouldn't be around your family so openly so and other people so let's take the same measures and treat COVID the same from my general knowledge again not a medical professional 
is that COVID-19 is a new strand of a, of a COVID. COVID is not new it's in itself, but COVID-19 is a new strand. And so, again, we'll have that discussion later with Dr. Abraham and some other professionals that can help break that down even more. Maybe Dr. Spites can be a return guest and help break that down some more. Absolutely. As well. And talk about what are the updates? You know, it's been almost a year now. Well, almost. So what have been some of the new, the updates yeah. on the virus? So we would definitely now, keep you all informed. You know, again, I just to encourage people to follow our social media, NYITCOMAR. Um, when Dr. Spites does a public interview, for example, he did Let's Talk Jonesboro last week with Bill Campbell, uh, the city of Jonesboro. And he addressed some of the very specific questions and concerns people have about the vaccine. Um, those questions, those answers are very readily available. Um, we, we post all that stuff. And again, Dr. Spites um, on his own Facebook page is addressing a lot of the, the latest news and issues and concerns that people have. So plug into us um, uh, to, to read that. And um, Dr. Spites also interacts with people on his page there. So if you have questions for him, um, those can be posted there. And um, and hopefully, hopefully people will continue to learn more and understand more about how we combat this thing. All right. Well, thank you, Casey. And I want you all to stay tuned to KLEK because we will be bringing you more health-related topics with the help of Casey and other professionals, uh, uh, the doctors and instructors at NYIT. Um, for January, I know there are many other health awareness issues, but cervical cancer is one that is recognized in January. And so we hope to bring a discussion soon about that. If not, maybe put a, a social media campaign out encouraging women to get tested, get checked, go to your exams and things of that nature. I'm not a gynecologist, but I'm a woman. So anyway, um, so that's one issue that we would definitely talk about before the month is over. But I want to thank you again, Casey, for joining us. And if you see a student in any facility, Show them some love and respect. They're working hard to learn their craft and be a top-notch uh, doctor when their time comes. So please work with them and not against them. <laughs> Camilla, thank you so much for having us today. Thank you all for the uh, the job that you all do to inform our community on a number of topics. We enjoy partnering with you all and look forward to growing that relationship. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Casey. And stay tuned for tomorrow's show we will have one of our local judges to talk about the amnesty program. That has been a great program. So also Ms. Linda Johnson says, finally, we have to enforce these mandates. So that's right. We want to thank everyone for tuning in. Thank you for supporting Kaylee K and join us tomorrow at 9 a.m. Have a great and blessed day. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Casey. Let me stop the live feed. Thank you everyone for checking in on our Facebook live. Um, do you have any questions? All right.